Okay. Personal statement. By the way, my name's Collins Bird. <laughs> That's me. I'm the Assistant Dean of Enrollment Management at the University of Iowa College of Law. That is Evangeline Mitchell's alma mater for law school. I was not there when she was in law school. I was the Assistant Dean of Admission at a different law school when she was in law school. But I am now at Iowa. I've been here at Iowa for 13 years. I've been in enrollment management for a total of 33 years. And I've uh, been in the law school enrollment management world for 28 years. Now the reason why I mention all this is there's nothing that says that I know everything there is to know about enrollment management. But the definition of work experience is having made your mistakes on someone else's budget. <laughs> and I have made some doozies on someone else's budget. And so the ones I make now in my life, personally and professionally, are little ones. Little ones that I can take back. So I will give you some information, I hope, that will help you when you write your personal statement. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Even without the microphone, can you hear me? No. Okay. I don't like my I'm the son of a minister. <laughs> I like to walk around. I like to walk around when I talk. All right. That good? Yes. Okay. This allows me to walk around. It's just, it's more my style. Okay. A couple of things. Um, some of you may or may not want to take notes, but if you don't, that's okay. Because I will be more than happy to send you a copy of this presentation via email. So I'm going to try to move along rather quickly here because they gave me some time, but not quite enough. But that's OK. Just come up here and get a business card at the end of the presentation or at the beginning, whenever. This is, boy, she's like in the starting blocks. All right, come on up. But also, I have enough for everyone, don't worry. But also, um, at the end of the presentation, I will have my email address on the screen. So don't worry about it. You will see my email address on the screen at the end of the presentation. But I should have enough business cards up here. <laughs> that was funny. I was like, got business cards up here. And she was like, elbowing people. It's like a professional wrestling flying elbow drop from the top rope. All right, I'll stop. No, I won't. Yes, I will. Is this thing on? Oh, I tell you, I was ugly as a kid. I was so ugly. I used to make a funeral, turn up a side street. Oh, I was ugly. Oh. I tell you, I had a blind date once. Her name was Louise. I went up to her and I said, are you Louise? She looked at me and said, are you Collins? I go, yeah. She goes, I'm not Louise. Oh. She's getting all of them. Some of you are sitting over there going, what the hell just happened? She's up there. OK. Uh, all right, personal statement. I'm here talking about how they didn't give me enough time, and I'm cracking old Rodney Dangerfield jokes. All right, the first thing I want to do is to make you all think about things that don't have too much to do with how to actually write a personal statement, technically. Because if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter what you write about. It doesn't matter where you go. Full disclosure, I have an MBA. I do not have a law degree. I do not have a law degree because I don't want a law degree. I don't want a law degree because I don't argue well with people. You either lead, as I was saying to uh, the person I was talking to in the back room there, you either lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. That's, that's pretty much how I operate. And that comes based on some life experience. Now, there's nothing wrong with a law degree. I've been married to a lawyer for 33 years. And she is the smartest person I've ever met. I married up in terms of intelligence, okay? So she's very, very smart. But we solve problems in a different way. She's used her law degree skills. I use an MBA. So um, I look at this from a number of unique and interesting perspectives. But I honestly believe that if I can give you a sense of making you think about why you need a law degree, then you'll be on the track to write a good personal statement. Okay? 
Why do people attend law school? Some people want to know what lawyers know. Those are people who want to learn about the substantive foundations of a specific topic or area of law. They're interested in a specific practice area like tax, corporate law, intellectual property, public policy, criminal law, civil rights law. There's a specific area that they're interested in. And then there's some people who want to go to law school because they want to do what lawyers do. They're more interested in the practical skill sets that lawyers will bring to the area of practice. They are interested in litigation, of preparing for litigation, policy development, management uh, of litigation and trial, management of a transaction that goes on behind the scenes. A lot of corporate lawyers in this country never see the inside of a courtroom. That's one of the beauties of law school. And in fact, I'll give you a statistic, 90% of the lawyers in this country never see the inside of a courtroom because if they do their jobs well, neither they nor their clients ever have to see a courtroom because they're doing well. They're doing what they're supposed to do. So you don't have to necessarily be the kind of person that has to be in court to get a law degree. Uh, my wife is one of those people. She's a transaction-based lawyer. She did corporate securities law, which basically meant if the Securities and Exchange Commission liked the deal, then it was good. And she spent 25 years doing that. But some people want to go because they want to do what lawyers do. They want to learn the theoretical, theoretical and practical skills that lawyers use to solve problems. And the specific area of law is not really that relevant uh, at the beginning of law school. They'll figure that out in time. One of the things you'll hear or find out about law school, it's one of the few graduate degrees that never forces you to choose a major. As opposed to business school, which is what I did, I had to choose between marketing, finance, accounting, strategic planning, whatever it was. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why MBA programs require or really encourage you to get some work experience prior to going because you really have to go into business school knowing, having a pretty good idea of what you want to do because it's only two years long. So business school is more of a sprint. Law school, you never have to choose a major. You can go into law school, 50% of the people, another stat from my years of experience, 50% of the people who I have enrolled in law school were clueless as to what they wanted to do. They said something nice in a personal statement that made me say, yep, okay, they have an idea. But they were clueless. 40% had a clue, but were gonna change their minds. They come in wanting to do this, they get out doing that, and you're not really sure how they went from this to that, but they're on their way. There are only about 10% of the people who start law school in this country who really have an idea as to what they wanna do. And those are usually intellectual property people. Those are scientists, a lot of STEM majors. Uh, public interest people, civil rights, environmental law. Those are the general areas where you'll find that 10% who come into law school knowing what they want to do, and that gone it, phew, they're pretty much going that way. So law school is one of those things that you can get into with some flexibility, and you kind of figure it out usually by the end of the second year of law school, but actually by the end of the first semester, second year, okay? And then there are some people who want to know what lawyers know and do what lawyers do. And a lot of those people are joint degree students. Those are individuals who want to be able to create the policy, want to have, be sitting at the table when policy is being developed, but they also want to know how to implement the policy. You may find when you go to law school that the JD degree, the law degree, will give you everything you need to know. You may not need a joint degree, so don't think you have to get a JD MBA or a JD MPP or a JD something else. A lot of these uh, uh, universities that have uh, law schools, they're big enough where you can get a, a joint degree with just about any graduate program they have. I know at University of Iowa, just as an example, you can get a joint degree with any graduate program we have at the University of Iowa. We even have two or three JD MD students a year. Those people are nuts. They've been taking their own drugs or something. I don't know what's going on there. But no, they have pretty good ideas as to why they want to do it. They want to get into health policy, development of policy. And it really became more important and more uh, interesting to students when the healthcare debate really began to ramp up, beginning into early to mid-90s under President Clinton, and then with President Obama uh, having that as one of his first initiatives. A lot of people, both for and against, really want to come and get involved in public policy of healthcare. So the JDMD program became more important. 
But again, that's one of the few programs, by the way, where if, for those who are interested in JDMD, you really have to know early on that you want to do that. Just about every other graduate program, you can start law school, go through a year, year and a half of law school, and then decide whether or not you want to get a joint degree. But some people want to know what lawyers know and do what lawyers do, and those are the joint degree prospects. And then there are some people who don't want to know what lawyers know, who don't necessarily want to go to law school to do what lawyers do, but there are certain skill sets that they know that law school is going to develop and that they have those skill sets, they have the basic fundamentals down, but the skill sets can be refined even more for law school. And here are the major skill sets that law school is going to take advantage of. Law school is gonna make you read a lot, more than you ever thought you'd wanna read. It's gonna make you write a lot. The most important skill you can bring to law school is your ability to write. Uh, unfortunately, I came in due to some travel logistics. I, I missed last night's law fair, so I wasn't there. But hopefully some of my colleagues and representatives from some of the other schools that were here told you that writing is the most important skill you can bring to law school. If you forget everything else I've said, remember that one, because that's going to help you no matter where you go. You gotta be able to rewrite a lot. Take the criticism you get from your faculty members as constructive. You can be a straight A major, English major, 4.0. You will get things kicked back to you all marked up with red marks all over it. It's constructive criticism. They're trying to turn you from a good or excellent writer into a freaky good or freaky excellent writer. It is that important. Research a lot. A lot of your papers that you write for law school and in your practice are going to be research papers. Being able to navigate a law library is going to be really, really important. Speak in public. This is a skill that some people are comfortable with and some are not. But whether it's a classroom of six or a classroom of 50 or a classroom of a country of 330 million people, you're going to have to get up and say your piece. And you will have a day in law school in the first year where you're going to have to get up and speak your piece. One of the foundations of the Socratic method, which is the way in which most law school classes are taught, there's going to be a day when it's going to be your day to present the class, the, the case to the class. And the professor will come up and ask you a question. And if it's a 50 minute, let's say if it's a 60 minute class, he or she is going to be asking you questions for the next 50 or 60 minutes. And if you get stuck, They'll go to you to help her out. And then if, when you're done helping her out, they're gonna come right back to you. So being able to speak in public, it's a, it's a skill that you can learn and become comfortable with. The key to speaking in public is dominate your subject. Know what you're talking about. It's amazing how easy public speaking is if you dominate your subject. The, uh, the, the person who was up here uh, before you all went to lunch, the, the lady who was the entertainment lawyer, talked about essentially dominating the subject, knowing your argument and your opposition's argument, as well as the opposition knows their argument. Dominate that subject, and public speaking will not be a problem. But it takes time and it takes work. Think critically. Don't believe everything you see, read, or hear. There are multiple sides to every story. Possess a healthy respect for history. Judges make decisions based on precedent Precedent is just another name for history. Now, you don't have to be a history major. In fact, if you look at majors uh, among law school students who enter, I'd say it, it, nationally, maybe 25% of the majors are political science. But most law schools have majors, have anywhere from 40 to 50 to 60 different majors. So if 25% of the people majored in one thing, that means 75% of the entering class nationally majored in 40, 50, 60 other things. So don't think you have to be a political science major. It's nice, but it's not required. I've enrolled math majors, accounting majors, zoology majors, engineers, doctors. I am more interested in the skills that you've developed within your curriculum. 
be a math major, be an engineering major, but take a lot of writing courses. That's the key. Focus on the skill sets that you're developing and don't worry too much about the major. Especially those of you who are freshmen or sophomores who haven't chosen the major. If you're junior or senior, that's fine. Again, I don't really care about the major. The skill sets are more important. Patience with the process of learning, and that's the Socratic method. Critical thinking skills, writing skills, intellectual curiosity, and patience with the whys and the what ifs. Uh, when you get up to make the presentation to that professor during the Socratic method, that professor is going to spend 50 minutes talking to you, and you're going to be writing notes just like she's doing right now. She's writing notes. I just, don't, just write notes. Yeah, you missed that note. That one, right there. <laughs> But they're going to be asking you, why and what if? They're going to say why, and you're going to come up with an answer. And then the professor is going to change the variables and say, okay, well, what if this happens? And you'll come up with an answer. And that professor is going to say, well, what if this happens? And you'll come up with an answer. And he or she is going to keep on doing that, and then you're going to get stuck. Don't worry about it. For those of you in the room that have a 180 and a 4.0 and went to some famous, wonderful school, there's going to be a day in law school where you're going to get stuck. There's going to be a day in law school where you're going to look to the left and look to the right and go, I have no idea what the heck that, that concept is. Do you? And they're going to look at you and go, mm -mm. that's okay. You'll figure it out. Being able to manage the grind is a part of law school. But once you're done, once you have exhausted the whys and the what ifs, they're going to come right back to you and keep asking you questions about the case. Okay? Okay. Here is another concept that I don't want you to forget. The first one was the importance of writing. Writing is the most important skill you can bring to law school. Here's the next one. Why do you need a law degree? I am not concerned about why you want one. I told someone once that I really didn't care why they wanted one, and that got me in trouble with my dean. So I won't say, I don't care. You, ne you never heard me say, I don't care. Right? Good answer. Oh, you're like butter. You're on a roll. <laughs> Just sing on. Oh. I tell you, I was ugly as a kid. I went to the beach once, and I, I lost my parents. I went to the cop, and I said, sir, I've lost my parents. Where do you think they could be? The cop looked at me and said, I don't know, kid. There's so many places they could hide. Oh. Thank you very much. I honestly am not concerned about why you want a law degree. Because what you want is different from what you need. You want... You need clothes to go to work. You want a suit. You might want a gray suit. You might want a blue suit. You may want one that's got pinstripes. You may want one that's got plaids. You may want something. But you need a suit. You need clothes. You need food. You need something. The need gets to what's here. The need gets to what's here. And I am much more interested in what's here. For those of you that can't see me, I'm pointing to my heart, my chest. What do you, why do you need a law degree? Quick story. I was a freshman in college. Um, I attended Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah, buddy. Um, I was a freshman. I also was a football player. And I was in this dorm. Are you, did you go to Dartmouth? Smith Hall, right up the hill from the field house. I was in Smith Hall my freshman year. And I was there with another football, this is one of those midnight bowl sessions that all freshmen had, like, gee, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna get through this place? And at, at Dartmouth, there, I mean, there are some major academic requirements, I suspect you can imagine. So we're sitting there wondering how we're gonna do this. And there's a foot myself, another football player, a basketball player, and a hockey player. So we're all in sports that take up a lot of time outside of the classroom. And so we're all going through what we're gonna do and what we're gonna major in and all this. And someone said, well, what about law school? And there was like this seven second pregnant pause and we all looked at each other and went, nah. <laughs> because I, at that point, didn't think I needed a law degree. I hadn't put in my head why I needed one. If I had waited a few years, I probably would have said, hey, you know, a law degree would be really helpful for the things that I'm, I'm passionate about. 
But that's the key, is to figure out, take some time to figure out why you need a law degree. Okay, what are you trying to convey with the personal statement? You wanna tell the admissions committee what you really want it to know about you. Why do you need a law degree? Not why you want one, because why you want one's gonna change with the wind. But that need, that'll stay with you. Things about you, you want to tell the admissions committee, things about you that the rest of the application will not show. The LSAT, the LSAT is an indication of how you did on a standardized test that's been around since 1947, and it is a snapshot of how you were doing on Saturday morning whenever you took it, or how, how rough a Friday night you had, okay? Now the LSAT, when used with the GPA, is a pretty good indicator of first year law school performance. It's a pretty good test, but there's some, it's not perfect. There's some things with the issues with it. We need to be very careful how much emphasis we put on it. So we are very careful about the LSAT in terms of what, we, how it, uh, what it says about you. GPA is a reflection of how you've done among 30 to 35 professors that you had or will have had by the time you graduate from college. And they don't know your life. They don't know everything that there is to know about you. Letters of recommendation, the same. Letters of recommendation come from people that know you well, can speak to your talents to do well in law school, but they don't know all the badges of courage that it took for you to get where you are, academically or personally. So that personal statement is your message that goes directly from you to the admissions committee that tells us what you really want us to know about you, and the emphasis is on personal. Your personal statement is gonna be different from hers, Yours is going to be different from his, and his is going to be different from his. And none of you are going to have a personal statement that are as good as his. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the emphasis is on personal. Key points to remember. The personal statement. This is not the opportunity to rehash your resume. Some schools ask for a resume. It's optional for some schools. Some schools require it. You don't have to repeat that. This will be the committee's first personal impression of you, since most law schools do not co co uh, conduct interviews. Um, there are only, oh, I can think only two or three law schools that have a national reputation and who are rather aggressive in their interviewing process. Um, I think Vanderbilt is one, Northwestern is one. Um, I don't know about Harvard. I don't know about some of these other schools. We don't have an interview process. It takes a lot of time and effort and coordination to have interviews. Um, and most law school admissions offices are very small. When I did Dartmouth undergrad admissions back in the late 70s and early 80s, there were 13 of us. 13 undergrad admissions officers at Dartmouth. At University of Iowa Law School, there are two of us. Now I have a staff of five total that help coordinate this whole process. But there's myself and there's a director of admissions. That's it. And I have close to 2,000 applicants a year. I can't interview everybody. And I need someone, I would need someone to help coordinate the alumni. Because a lot of the schools that do interviewing on an aggressive basis have alums to help out. And that in itself takes some coordination. So think about the personal statement as a written interview. And it's also, finally, your first writing assignment. I've worked at three different law schools over 28 years within the law school world. Every admissions committee that I have been on, I have number one, had a vote, and number two, there has been either, either a clinical faculty member or a legal writing instructor on the committee. And those two entities within the law school world will hammer you hard if you don't write well. So make sure that your personal statement is well written. Okay, now let me stop here and tell you something else. For those of you who are looking for an example of a good personal statement or a bad one, or one that worked or didn't work, I'm not going to give that to you. I stopped doing that a couple of years ago for the following reason. I used to give out examples of statements that worked and didn't work, and then during the course of the admissions process, because again, like I said before, I read every file, every application, no matter where you are in, in my pool, I read every single one. 
And over the course of time, I've looked at personal safe and said, that's kind of familiar. <laughs> Damn, that's the one that I presented to the group in Washington, D.C. or wherever I was. And I could tell that people were just lifting what I put in there, changed a few little details to make it look personal, and then submitted it. So I don't do that anymore. But I will give you an outline. And that's what this is. This also allows you to focus on the personal. What is driving you to go to law school? Why do you need a law degree? Because your reasons for law school are going to be very different from his. So focus on this outline. The acronym that I like to use is PREP, P-R-E-P. The first P says for you to make your point. And this means you start off by sharing your experiences or strengths that make it necessary for you to have a law degree. You're self-motivated. You can work with others. You have analytical skills. You like to write. You like to read. We'll get to the long-term goal in a second. But make your point. The R stands for the reasons why it is important that we know about that point. Okay, you say you're self-motivated, can work with others, have great analytical skills. But why is it important that we know that? Who cares? Why is it important? You need to articulate that to us. You cannot assume that we're going to say, well, you're just a wonderful person, you want to apply to law school, what's wrong with it? No. You need, to, you need to give us some more detail. The E stands for examples. Provide examples of what you've learned from those life experiences that have developed that point. What are some examples of things you've learned from those experiences that have helped you develop those points? And then the final P is to make that first point again and tell us how it will make you a successful law school student, a better lawyer, or better problem solver. And this is the part where you can say why you need a law degree. Okay? You can take that outline, take that outline, that acronym, and that can be page one. Let's say I'm self-motivated. I'm just gonna take an example. I'm self-motivated. You can talk, follow those points to talk about why you're self-motivated, some examples of what developed this motivation in you, and how that self-motivation is gonna help you be a better lawyer, better student, better citizen, better something, and why you need a law degree. What about that self-motivation has led you to go to law school, as opposed to business school, medical school, school of public policy, whatever it is? Here's page one. And then page two, I can work with others. Follow this acronym for page two. Third one, I have great analytical skills. Okay, give us some examples of what you've done in your life that show that you have great analytical skills. So what are some examples of what you've learned from those experiences and how it's gonna make you a better lawyer, better student, better citizen? Follow this acronym, follow this outline for the two or three or four major things you want us to know about you and you'll be okay. Okay, let's go into a little bit more detail about that first P in that acronym PREP. Let's start with that first P. One thing you can talk about is you can brainstorm about significant aspects of your life based on your education, your work experience, your activities, or your personal experience. Um, I am old enough to have integrated two schools in my life. One in Hartsville, South Carolina in 1968 and one was a private school in, of all places, Greenwich, Connecticut in 1970. Both of those experiences had some common themes to them. And one of those themes was, well, there were two. One, there was always at least one student or one teacher who really didn't want you there and was more than happy to tell it to you. And two, if you break their nose, they'll listen. Now, again, this is late 60s, early 70s. Back in the South, back in the day, those were, there were fighting words. And if certain people called you something, you can get away with duking the kid out and you wouldn't get in jail. Now, I'd be hauled in to juvie or whatever the current version of juvie is. But late 60s, early 70s, that's what you did. 
So I could write a personal statement that says, the reason why I am interested in education law is because I have the experience of being denied access due simply to my race. Now remember, this is 14 years after Brown v. Board of Education. I guess the Pony Express never got to Hartsville, South Carolina. I don't know what happened. But those are, there's a life experience there that I can talk about. You all have your unique and interesting life experiences that you can talk about that are driving you to do this. So you can talk about your education, your work experience, your activities, or your personal experience. The reasons. How have those various experiences helped you grow? What do they demonstrate about your abilities? Do they show your interests? Just because you went through a certain experience doesn't mean that you necessarily want to go into that kind of law. I mean, I may have integrated a school or two in my life, but that doesn't mean I go into civil rights law or education law. I can go into corporate law. So you want to talk about how do they show your interests. Number three, examples of lessons learned. Some of the experiences could have been examples of you developing your analytical skill, your analytical ability, your writing ability, discipline, motivation, creativity, imagination. I won't go down the list there. But what have you learned from those experiences? And those are just a few examples of things that you may want to think about. I'm going to change the page. I know some of you are writing. I'm going to change the page. And then number four. Repeat the major point or points, and how will these experiences make you a successful law school student, better lawyer, better problem solver? And something else I like to, to see, and again, this is not required, but I like to see why a certain law school is a better fit for you than another. So if you were to apply to Harvard, it would be okay to put something in it that says, I'm interested in this kind of law, here's my life experience, here are the things that are driving me to go to law school, and I think Harvard has these things. And these things could be a clinic, a research institute, a scholarly publication, something beyond the classroom. Because every school is going to have classes in whatever it is you're interested in. But if a school has a clinic, a research institute, or a scholarly publication in something you're interested in, that's a school that lets you go above and beyond and maybe do your own independent research and writing. So putting something in that says how law school X would be a, a good fit for you to prepare for your career be good. Check the grammar and spelling, punctuation and capitalization carefully. Proofread it, spell check it, and then proofread it again. Spell check sometimes accepts spellings that I have never seen before. And if neither I nor anyone on the admissions committee has ever seen it, it probably doesn't exist. I mean, there are people on the committee who've been teaching two years, or people on the committee who've been teaching 50 years. I'm the only one that's ever had to actually fill a class, but there's a wide variety of experiences there. So proofread it, spell check, and proofread it again. Have several people review your statement. Preferably not relatives. Your relatives are gonna love you no matter what. You could be a saint or a psycho. Your relatives are gonna love you, okay? But have your friends. Friends who can tell you that you're way off, you're not even close to describing who you are, why you wanna to go to law school, and you'll still be friends with them when they're done. That kind of friend who can tell you you're crazy and you'll still love them and they'll still take care of you, okay? Do not be afraid of feedback. Stars love feedback. Michael Jordan was notorious and famous for his desire to have feedback. Even when he scored 35 and gotten 10 rebounds, he wants feedback. He likes feedback. Proofread the final version before you send it because you'd be surprised how many personal statements I get for people who want to go to a different school. They'll say, so therefore, Mr. Bird, University of, of Washington or Georgetown, I don't know why, we, I, I think I, I have an idea as to why we get a lot for people who want to go to Georgetown or George Washington, because we all have, Iowa has a pretty good public policy area, a lot of people, a lot of uh, professors who do that, and as does Georgetown and GW. So we get a lot of personal statements that are addressed to GW or Georgetown, 
And I know the folks who work in the admissions office there, and I go, hey, I got your personal statement. Do you have mine? <laughs> so you don't want that to happen. You don't, you don't want to be that person, okay? So proofread it. And make sure the document reflects what you want us to know about you. Again, the emphasis is on personal. Follow the directions specific to a particular law school. Please type it. Utilize double spacing unless the enrollment management committee or unless the school says something different. Follow the length guidelines given by the school. Uh, my first boss, when I got out of Dartmouth in 1979, yep, now you do the thing, oh, how old is he? I got out of Dartmouth in 1979 was Al Quirk. He's the now deceased director of admissions at Dartmouth. He died last October, a little over a year ago. I learned so much from him. Al was a World War II veteran who was a bit, he was very progressive, very progressive, which is interesting because he was in the Marine Corps, fought in the Pacific during World War II. Very, very liberal guy. But he was a no-nonsense guy when it came to working for him. Al had a way in which the world was gonna work and you were gonna work his way or else you were gonna find another job. But Al said this one thing, one, and Al had a lot of what we call them corkisms. I mean, he had some strange lines. This one was great. The thicker the file, the thicker the applicant. If a law school asks for a three-page personal statement and you write one that is 17 pages long, you've got a problem. I have, in the years that I've been doing this, I have never asked for a personal statement more than three pages. But I got one once that was 22 pages long. That guy had issues. I don't know if it was the recreational drugs. I don't know what it was. But the lights were on, but nobody was home with that guy. He didn't get into law school. At least not into my law school at the time. But my personal record is a 22-page personal statement. When I asked for one, that was, seven, that was three. I don't know, I'm not gonna ask for one at 17. Same thing with letters of recommendation. Most law schools require letters of recommendation. Most law schools require two, at least three max. Don't wanna send in more than three. My personal record, 19. If you send in 19 letters of recommendation and I only ask for three, there are some things you're trying to hide. You're trying to hide a bad LSAT, a bad GPA, a criminal history, or you're just a knucklehead. And I don't have time for that. Neither does my dean of students, okay? Follow the directions. Stay true to the directions and you'll be okay. All right, the personal statement is designed to tell me why you need a law degree those one or two or three things that are driving you to go to law school as opposed to some other program and gives you the opportunity to tell us how you're gonna use those skills to solve problems, whatever those problems may be. But then there's the optional addendum. We're shifting gears here to a different document because the optional addendum is not designed to tell me why you wanna to go to law school. This is different. To begin this part, I'm going to give you a couple of quotes here. Stand up straight and realize who you are, that you tower over your circumstances. It's Maya Angelou. Second one is my mother. Stand up and be counted. She's 89 years old, and she is still a force in the community. She's interesting. I found out that becoming a grandparent will determine where you decide to move to. When I moved, I, I worked in, and lived in Minnesota for 23 years. I moved to Iowa about 13 years ago. I thought, okay, mom's gonna stay here. But my family, my wife and my daughter, who at the time was 12, we moved to Iowa. Within seven months, mom found a way to get to Iowa. <laughs> Home is where the grandchild is. Not me. And I'm an only child. <laughs> and that's okay. Because my, my daughter, who is now, she's a, now 25 years old, she's a social worker in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's a city just north of us. 
She's a social worker there. She and my mom are like tight, really, really tight. It, it actually is pretty cool. But this is how I'm going to start talking about the addendum. There's going to be a, a time in your life when you had to stand up and be counted, when you had to rise above circumstances and remember who you are and being grounded and get over some really difficult situations. Now, the addendum is usually optional. There aren't too many schools that make it required. I'm sorry. And, uh, and there are some schools that may not allow it. So if a school gives you the opportunity to write an addendum, feel free to, to use it. If the school doesn't say anything about the addendum, or they, they don't want it or something, call that school up and ask them if you can write one. They'll say no. If they say no, then don't write one. Remember what I said before, follow the directions. But there are probably more than a few people in this room who can write an addendum about something. I'm gonna take a leap of faith and say the majority of us in this room. The addendum is used to describe those character building experiences, those examples of sustained motivation and perseverance. These issues may not be driving you to go to law school. They may not be driving your decision to go to law school, but they need to be said. Again, in my life experience, I would want to go to law school to study and hopefully practice a certain area of law. But I would write an addendum to talk about what it was like to integrate a couple schools because that says a lot about my perseverance and my, my mental and emotional toughness to keep going when there are people that say you can't do it. And some of them are quite open about saying you can't do it. That's what the addendum is for, is to talk about those things that aren't necessarily driving you to go to law school, but there are things that are feeding your motivation and your perseverance that says, I'm still coming. I'm still gonna show up. And you're gonna have to reckon with me. You can talk about the educational benefits of diversity. You can about, talk about obstacles overcome in your life, what I call badges of courage. History of maybe a history of poor standardized test taking. Perhaps you do really well in the classroom, but standardized tests, be it ACT, SAT, GMAT, GRE, LSAT, whatever it is, maybe you're just not a good standardized test taker. The addendum is the place where you can talk about that and say, I know my standardized test doesn't look all that great, but look, my track record of success in the classroom is really good. And that GPA is an indication of how hard you work. And we know that. Let me talk very quickly about the educational benefits of diversity. Uh, hopefully, you will not be someone who's going to go in, check a box on the application that says, I'm, I'm black, <coughs> I'm female, I'm African American, I'm, I'm whatever, I'm some category and expect that to sort of be it. That is not what we're looking for. The commitment that law schools have to the educational benefits of diversity involves the richness of the class discussion that comes from your being in that class. Problems are solved in a much more efficient and effective manner when there are various opinions being voiced in that classroom or in that problem-solving environment. And what we are interested in is hearing and reading about how your background, how your educational and personal professional experiences will add to the richness of the class discussion. That is the educational benefits of diversity. So please don't check a box and say, well, I got that whole diversity thing taken care of because you will get turned down faster than a bat out of hell. The educational benefits of, of diversity is what we're looking for. Criminal or legal issues. Check your records, tell us everything. Every application to every American Bar Association accredited law school, and just FYI, those are the law schools you want to apply to. Um, there are some states that have non-accredited schools. California in particular has a number of non-accredited schools where if you go there, you can only practice in the state of California. If you ever leave California, those schools aren't gonna help you. So go to an ABA, American Bar Association accredited law school, and then your degree will be portable. You can move around and do a lot of different things 
pretty much anywhere in the, in the country. But on every one of those applications, there's going to be a question. We call it the character and fitness question. And it is the question where you have to tell us about any criminal indiscretions or misbehavior or anything like that. Read this question carefully because there are some schools that will ask only about convictions. They don't care about if the charges are dropped or anything like that. If you were convicted of something, that's what they want to know. And then there are some schools that want to know everything, even if the charges are dropped, expunged, anything like that, okay? Tell us everything. And a lot of states will allow you to go online because they'll have it online now. You can kind of check and see if, if there's anything. Um, it is rare in all the years I've been doing this, it is rare for me to find someone who has done something that would disqualify them from going to law school, except for felonies. If you have a felony conviction, that's a different story. And you have to deal with the, the uh, local bar association. Because what's going to happen, the, uh, the application for admission is going to be shared with the districts uh, that you're going to take the bar in. And they're going to check the application for admission and compare it to the application to sit for the bar. You have to actually apply, fill out an application to sit for the bar exam. They're going to compare what you said on the application for admission to what you said on the bar exam. And if there's any discrepancy, they're going to put that into a different pile and they may call you up and ask you to explain it. 99% of the time, it can be explained. It's a simple mistake or, yeah, I forgot. It's no big deal. But you don't want to be that person. Tell us everything. It, again, it is rare for me to hear about something or see something that somebody did that disqualifies them from law school. Separate the personal statement from the optional addendum. Again, one tells me why you want to go to law school, why you need a law degree. The addendum tells me about those badges of courage and those things that are feeding your motivation that'll get you over and through law school. And own up to your mix mistakes. Excuses are not welcome. Okay. Final thoughts on the educational benefits of diversity, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, good, I have time. They had me wait to start at 2.20, so I've got until, good, I have about 10 minutes for questions. Race per se is not as important as, it, as the educational benefits of diversity. I already talked about that. But race may shape your life, your life experience, and add context to the rest of the criteria that is reviewed. Now I'm gonna go through, very quickly, some of the things we consider to be a part of the educational benefits of diversity. Because a lot of you have, forget about race and ethnicity, a lot of you fit these categories. Academic or professional abilities not reflected in the GPA. Disabilities or serious health factors that affected your prior academic performance. Extracurricular activities that may have taken up a lot of time. Exceptional work commitments mandated by family and financial circumstances. Perhaps you all had to take care of family and had to work your way through school. We want to know about that. Post-baccalaureate success, including graduate study. How many people in here have a graduate degree already? We want to know about it. Public service commitments. Law-related employment experience. Leadership in groups that are historically underrepresented educational or socioeconomic disadvantage. For some of you, primary language was not English. You want to know about that. Unusual motivation and perseverance to overcome obstacles to study law. And then finally, other relevant information that relates to the applicant's qualifications for academic potential. Now, the final thing in bold, it's ironic that I would be here talking about this because uh, recently, Sandra Day O'Connor was, uh, is, we found out, is now uh, ill. And she's suffering from the early stages of dementia. But when she was on the Supreme Court, she was a part of a rather important Supreme Court decision that affected what I, just for the sake of time and argument, will call an affirmative action case. Um, frankly, at this point, I don't know what affirmative action is anymore, even though I've been doing it and practicing it since 1979. I don't know what it is anymore. But 
I do know what the educational benefits of diversity are, and I'm committed to that. But in 2003, there were two people who sued the University of Michigan Law School. One was a Caucasian woman who was suing the University of Michigan undergrad program. The other was a Caucasian woman who was suing the University of Michigan Law School. They both said that they were denied admission because of their race. Now, I can't go into a lot of detail about these two individuals, but it's interesting. The person who was the Dean of Admissions at University of Michigan Law School is the former Dean of Admissions at University of Iowa Law School. His name is Dennis Shields. I know him really well. I'm gonna see him at a Clio event in about a week and a half. He's a great guy. He's one of the icons of our profession. And the undergraduate program actually lost its case because the undergraduate program, the undergraduate admissions office at University of Michigan was automatically adding points for people based on a racial classification. If you were black, you got black or Hispanic, you got like 20 points added to, however they quantify the points, they're adding 20 points based, if you were black or Hispanic. They were adding 30 or 40 points if you were Native American and they were adding like 10 or 20 points if you were Asian. I mean, it all depended on your race. Well, even I, having done this since 1979, said, oh, you can't do that. Oh, I know what, I know what you're trying to do. I know what your long-term goal is, but, oh. Well, the undergrad program lost. They got sued. The University of Michigan Law School won because Dennis read the entire file. Dennis was holistic and how he read the file. In the case, in the, the final decision, Senator Day O'Connor actually read the deciding opinion. She actually cited in favor of and supporting uh, the educational benefits of diversity for the law school. And she said this, paraphrase, making decisions based solely on numbers is just as bad as making decisions based solely on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or anything else. In other words, Read the entire file. Read both the academic and non-academic qualifications that you have, and then make a decision. If we read the entire file, and then decide that you don't qualify, okay, you don't get in. But if I make that decision based solely on race, or solely on an LSAT, I could get sued. I could be in trouble. And my baby still needs her college education paid for. She's got a lot of loans to go to school, and I'm still helping her pay it. So I need the job. Reading files based solely on a number is not good, okay? All right, here's my contact information. I think at some point I'm gonna get a high sign here that says I'm done, but can I take a few questions? Okay, all right, three minutes worth of questions. How's that? Here's my contact information, because I said before, if you don't get a card, that's all right. I will send you a copy of this entire presentation. Yes, ma'am. Um, so my name is Chidera. Um, my name is Chidera. Um, and my question is about the personal statement. So I've been sitting here like excited because I like um, got an idea for my personal statement. So that's why I was writing crazily. Um, so when we're writing about weaknesses, um, how should we frame that in a way that highlights how we overcome those weaknesses and yeah. Tell us what you learned from it. Everyone's got a weakness. Everyone makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But tell us what you learned from it and how it made you better. How you had to, at some point, get to recreate yourself and make yourself better so that you could become more than you seem. That, that's pretty much it. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. The question is, how do you talk about diversity and your ethnicity or race without sounding cliche? If you, if you tie it in, that's a very good question. If you tie it into why it is possibly driving you to go to law school, to, to practice a certain area of law, or if you tie it in to how 
the obstacles you may have had to overcome in your life have motivated you to get that law degree. Tie it into the long-term goal. The long-term goal is to be offered admission to law school so you can earn a law degree and practice a certain area of law to solve problems. So if it is tied into that real long-term goal of that, that is motivating me to solve these problems in our society, whether they be, be related directly to race or not, it's not important. But if you tie it in to how it's gonna help you in the long-term goal of solving problems and earn your law degree, then it's not cliche. Always tie it into the long-term goal. If you just say it just for the sake of saying it, then we're gonna go, okay, what, why are you telling me this? Does that help? Yeah, the question is how confidential are these applications? They are totally confidential. Uh, the only people who read the file and have access to it are the members of the Enrollment Management Committee. Even the dean would have to come to me and get permission to see it. The dean doesn't have access to my computer base. Uh, they are totally confidential. We do not share names. We don't share any of that biographical information, any identification number, social security number, if schools still use that. It is totally confidential. The only people that see it are people who have an educational need to know. And as far as an application for admission is concerned, that's the Enrollment Management Committee. So the six or seven people that I work with, and myself, and that's it. They have to come to me before they, and explain why they need to see it. Yes? Thank you. Um, regarding the personal statement, um, I have read that there's this disparity between African Americans and disadvantaged groups and whites or people of privilege, if you will, who are able to use family resources to invest in um, help with their personal statement, whether it's admission consultants and whatnot, and these tend to be very well crafted, well polished. There's a lot of things that really make it really stand out and brilliant. For a lot of African Americans who don't have those resources and they're on their own, it's hard to stack up against those polished statements. My question to you is, what are your thoughts on using admission consultants or professional help with uh, personal statements? And is there a concern from your perspective or or, or from your industry, if you will, um, with it being overly crafted and overly polished. Uh, I do have a problem with uh, personal statements being overly crafted. Um, I, uh, one thing that we have to counter people who use um, consultants is we have a transcript. If we have a transcript that says the person got B's and C's in English, but has a perfectly crafted personal statement, Remember, every one of these is read. I and two other members of the committee are gonna go, he didn't write that. Uh-uh, no way. So we have some checks and balances in the system. We also have letters of recommendation. And in our letter of recommendation, when we tell people what to say about you when they're writing a letter, we tell them, please focus on critical thinking skills and writing skills. And you'd be surprised at how honest. The professors who write your letters are obviously gonna to wanna to support you, but they're gonna be pretty honest in saying, what, what your challenges were in terms of um, using, uh, in terms of writing skill. I am not a fan of using admissions consultants because many of those people have never had to fill a class. Um, and they never had to read those personal statements. They are people who are basically crafting something that really doesn't exist. So I would prefer to see the personal statement come from the actual individual and have a pre-law advisor a trusted friend, an English professor, someone like that, read your personal statement as opposed to someone that you pay an admissions consultant for. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the, the, the question was how about the disparity? We really don't see in our application when we're reading those personal statements we really don't see the difference or the disparity. Uh, the people, and maybe it's just the, the types of people that law school attracts. 
It attracts people who are really pretty darn good writers. I really don't see that difference in terms of those people who have the money to get help with their personal statements and those that don't. We really don't see it. Um, the personal statements that we get have been written quite well uh, from pretty much everybody. Um, and so it's kind of hard to address that because I just don't see it. I wish I could help you a little more with that, but I just don't see it. Maybe, and maybe that's because we have been getting up and talking about the importance of writing for so long. That a lot of people that we attract, the people who aren't very good writers, will either not apply to law school or their advisors will tell them, you need to think about a different career or develop some writing skill before you apply. But by the time they get to filling out that application, uh, perhaps there are people who have gotten help from a professional consultant, but there are other individuals who have gotten help from their pre-law advisor, their English professors, and things that don't cost anything because your tuition is going into paying their salaries already. We just don't see that much of a difference by the time they get to us. Okay, I think I'm done. Uh, you've got the email. Oh, and I'll be, there's another thing going on here, but I'll be standing out in the back room there for a few minutes, but I don't want you to miss what's coming up either. Okay, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much, thank you.